Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to AgriFood Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. <clears throat> My name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today with Mylan. AgriFood Conversations is all about driving innovation in food and ag. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, and this month's is nu nutrient efficiency. And on today's call, we are joined by Peter Williams, CEO, and Dane. Give me Dane. How do I pronounce your last name here? Dane. Okay. Hague. Dane Haig, president of MyLand. Thank you. MyLand is using live native microalgae to rapidly improve soil health. Through its technology and services, the company is helping to tackle two of the world's biggest challenges, food security and climate disruption. They help growers create a healthier planet from the ground up, making our food more abundant and nutritious. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in my land's market. You are potential customers for their products and services. You've built a similar company in their space, or you have unique expertise and understand the challenges and opportunities that they may face. Before we get started, we do have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a moment to answer. And while the poll is running, uh, a few process comments, we are not soliciting investment in any way whatsoever. This presentation is to provide information to help my land find customers, mentors, or other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. Secondly, you can use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. Alternatively, at the Q&A portion, uh, you can raise your hand um, and I can unmute you and you can ask the, the MyLand team a question directly. Finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Peter and Dane from MyLand. Take it away, gentlemen. Thank you, Tom, and thanks to the ISELEC team for uh, including us here. We are going to run through our presentation. So we are MyLand, a soil health company focused on scalable regenerative agriculture solutions. What we've done is we've paired a breakthrough in science with very simple application for farmers. From the science side, what we do is we extract live native microorganisms directly from a farm soil. We rapidly reproduce those in mass quantities on site and deliver them in living form back into the soil on a continuous basis where they form the foundation for a healthy soil ecosystem. We pair that with a soil as a service model. So from a farmer's perspective, there's no equipment to own or operate. It's a simple monthly subscription fee and we become integrated on farm. What this does is allows farmers to implement regenerative agriculture practices, but in a way that's very simple and also very scalable, which is really one of the challenges with regenerative agriculture. So in very simple form, we install a system on a farm. We manage and operate it almost entirely remotely. And that system continuously delivers live native microalgae into the soil on a continuous basis. And we'll get into that in, in more detail. But by focusing on soil health, MyLand is helping to tackle two of the world's biggest challenges, food security and climate disruption. On the food security side, 95% of the food we eat comes from the soil, yet current, current farming practices are rapidly eroding that soil. So we've lost 30% of the Earth's topsoil since the 70s. We're losing a soccer field of arable land to soil erosion every five seconds. So we need to increase production from a decreasing base of soil to, increase, to, to meet the population needs as we as the world grows. The United Nations says we have as few as 60 crop cycles remaining if we don't fundamentally change the way we grow our food. So food security is, is a substantial problem that's, that's coming on the horizon. On the climate side, a lot of people don't know that there's well over two times as much carbon stored in the soil as in the atmosphere. But as we work that soil, till the soil and break it, to, break it up, we release that carbon into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And so for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, we take 10 tons of carbon out of the atmosphere on a per acre basis. So people are realizing now the role that soil is going to play in a decarbonization uh, environment going forward. And, and that role is, is massive. Just in terms of background, the current cycle, uh, traditional cycle for farming is really chemical and fertilizer based. Farmers look to fertilizers and chemicals to improve the yield or increase the yield from their land. 
Ultimately, though, over time, what that does is strips the soil of its organic matter. Soil becomes very compact. The porosity of that soil goes down. So you get a lot of water running off the soil. The salt content in the soil in the root zone builds up again because the water is not percolating those salts below the root zone. Crops grown in poor soil are more susceptible to negative impacts like weather um, or pests. Because the soil is now very compacted, you have to till it to break it up to be able to plant in it. Ultimately, you end up using more water. Yields go down over time. That ultimately leads to lower land values. And farmers go back for more solutions, which end up typically being fertilizers and chemicals. This is why my land exists. So we believe very passionately that healthy food, or sorry, healthy soil leads to healthy food, healthy people, and a healthy planet. This is why Dane and I love our jobs. This is why it's, it's become quite easy to hire and recruit very, very good people. We are a mission-driven company, and we all believe very strongly in our mission. Uh, but beyond a great mission, it's a very profitable business, particularly for the farmers who we serve. So from a farmer's perspective, we, we provide them a number of benefits. One, we allow them to implement regenerative practices in their operations in a very simple and scalable way. We're seeing more and more the large consumer packaged goods companies demanding their supply chains or implementing regenerative agriculture practices. They're leaving that solution very much up to the farmers. And so we, we provide them the ability to do that. We also increase crop values through yield and revenue enhancements lower input costs in terms of water, fertilizer, and tillage cost. Ultimately, more productive soil leads to more productive land and increased land values. And we see a, a huge potential opportunity for farmers in carbon capture using soil to, to capture carbon. And we'll be an enabling technology for that. So we baseline measure about 35 different soil metrics, one of course being carbon at multiple depths in the soil when we start and at various increments thereafter. And so we'll be able to, uh, to enable that carbon capture and the revenue stream from that going forward. In terms of specifically what we do. So when we work with a farm, we'll go out and we'll start by taking soil samples directly from the farm soil. We'll go back into our lab, we'll isolate native algae strains. So microalgae, think of it as unicellular organisms, the absolute base of the food chain in the soil's ecosystem. So non-predatory unicellular organisms, the fastest growing vegetable on the planet. We'll isolate specific native algae strains and we will scale that up. So we'll create a very densified form of algae in our lab. It takes about 75 days. It's a biological process to create that, that densified form of algae. During that period, we will install a myelin system on the farm, which plugs into the power, water, and irrigation system on farm. We will then inoculate that system with this densified form of native algae. And that system will then continuously reproduce in mass quantities uh, in living form that native algae. We can manage and operate the system remotely and the algae is delivered into the soil through the irrigation system on farm as per their, their standard irrigation schedule. If we were to look inside the box, we have two systems, one that can cover an area of up to 100 acres, one that can cover up to 1,000 acres. This is our larger system. It's housed in a 40 foot shipping container. It has what we call 17 algae production vessels or APVs along the back wall. And this can deliver 70 trillion live algae cells into the soil per day. Importantly though, that algae is in living form. So it will continue to live and multiply and replicate in the soil over a period of potentially up to a couple of weeks. So while we deliver 70 trillion algae cells to the soil per day, it continues to multiply in the soil. So we have two manufacturing facilities, one on farm, uh, in one in farm. In most basic form, you take water and it's sterilized through an ozone process. That along with nutrients and the algae and the algae production vessels, we percolate through CO2 and under LED lights, we continuously produce these live algae cells. And then, as I mentioned, we manage and operate the system remotely through our PLC system in a series of camera banks inside, inside this facility. Then from a farmer's perspective, we're making it as easy as possible for them to adopt our service. So we call it a soil as a service model. From their perspective, there's no upfront cost. There's no equipment to own or operate. It's a simple monthly subscription fee. Here's our standard pricing of $10,000 per month. 
Again, we can cover up to 1,000 acres. So think of it as $120 per acre per year. So very low relative cost in terms of the cost of production, both for lower value crops and obviously much smaller in terms of relative percentage for much higher value crops. We start out typically with initial two to five year term. The useful life of the system is about 15 years. We believe once we're on farm, we intend to be there essentially in perpetuity. The farmer gets the full benefit of the cost savings, full benefit of increased yield and revenue enhancements, and then obviously any, any benefit from increased land values going forward. And then we take care of everything here on the right side of the, uh, the screen. And then in terms of what happens in the soil. So by delivering the live native algae on a continuous basis, we impact in a positive way the chemical, physical, and biological makeup of the soil. So first and foremost, we increase the living organic matter in the soil by delivering living organics through the microalgae. But again, because it's the base of the food chain, what we're seeing is all the other microbes feed off of the increased microalgae in the soil. So we'll show an example later where the mycorrhizal fungi population increased 2,800% over a year uh, of having our system on farm. So overall, you get increased organic matter in the soil. The algae also produces carbonic acid. The carbonic acid reduces the pH in the soil and allows it to break up the calcium carbonates and magnesium carbonates, the things that form a crust on the soil and reduce the porosity of the soil. So the algae actually naturally aggregates the soil and increases the porosity through that aggregation process. So now you can have water and oxygen infiltrating into the soil, which are needed both from the roots of the plant, but also the, the microorganisms in the soil need both water and oxygen to, to survive. So that increased water infiltration, the algae also produces polysaccharides. The polysaccharides allow the water, or sorry, the, the soil to act like a sponge or a baby's diaper. So now the water infiltrates into the soil and it's held there in soluble form. So the water can be used by the plants. It also solubilizes the nutrients in the soil. So the, the NPKs that are in the soil naturally, so that efficiency or the utilization of the nutrients by the plants and the roots becomes far more efficient because now the, the nutrients are solubilized. The salt content goes down in the root zone because that water can percolate the salts now below the root zone. You end up using a lot less water because a lot less is running off and it's being held in the soil. You have to till the soil a lot less because the carbonic acid naturally aggregates the soil. You use a lot less fertilizer because it solubilizes the nutrients naturally occurring in the soil and the increased microbes can pull more nitrogen uh, into the soil through the plants. Crops grown in healthier soil are more resilient to negative impacts like weather. Ultimately, farmers are seeing increased yield, more nutritious food being produced. That leads to higher land values and ultimately, as I mentioned previously, it's a continuous, continuous basis. Walking through the benefits the farmers will receive, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through three specific case studies. It's somewhat dependent on what you're growing and where and what the current status of your soil is. So we've put in here a number of ranges for reduced input cost and increased output, as well as what farmers in certain areas of the country might receive in terms of improving land from, from poor or degraded land to more productive land value. We only work in irrigated situations. And we'll run through the three types of irrigation where we've, where we've been deployed. The first, I was on a melon operation in Arizona. This was a drip irrigation operation. So the results happen generally more rapidly and are more, more significant. This was, uh, we were given 200 acres of a 9,000 acre um, melon operation. Again, in Arizona, it was 200 acres that weren't even being used to grow anymore because they were so degraded. After our, our testing period, which three, three crop cycles, we were out producing the rest of the farm substantially. You'll see here the substantial return to the farmer in this situation. When we calculate our returns, we're really just looking at the cost of our system relative to the re reduction of input costs that the farmer achieved. We ignored, in this case, the yield and revenue enhancements which were significant, but across the board, you see substantial reductions in fertilizer, water, pesticides, and tillage cost, increase in yield and revenue coming from higher brick scores and more consistent, higher quality products, again, being produced where the land was not even used previously. So substantial 
and significant returns there on drip irrigation. This is an example of flood irrigation, an alfalfa farmer, Marvin John, who's been a great partner to the company as we've been developing our product and service out, to, out in the field. We're operating in a thousand acres of his operation. Marvin was having significant problems with his soil porosity and salt content in his soil. So to break up his soil between crop cycles, he was using substantial chemical soil amendments, including sulfuric acid, using a lot of water, spending up to $70,000 a month on electricity to pump water to flood irrigate his property. So the water reduction of 15% he's achieved using my land equates to 420 Olympic swimming pools of water and the cost savings on the electricity to pump that water pay for the cost of the system. So you've seen a 50% reduction in salt content of the soil. He's fully eliminated his chemical soil amendments and his yields have increased substantially. But overall, thinking about soil health, when we started the soil organic matter in, in, in Marvin soil was less than 1%. It's now hovering a little over 3%, which is obviously significant over three to four years we've been out installed on his soil. The, uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service recently from the USDA was out doing some surveys on this property, soil samples, and, and called them and asked him what, uh, what he was doing with his soil because in three of the five samples, they had found earthworms, which had not been present in, in this part of the world previously or in his farm previously, and he's a fourth generation farmer there. And the organic matter in his soil was well above anything they'd seen in the region. And really, it's, it's because of the implementation of the myeline system. So substantial results there on flood irrigation, a little, a little more slow in terms of the, the response. And then the third is also an alfalfa field. We've been out there 12 months now. This is on center pivot. And, and this highlights really how we, we work with growers, starting with soil health. So we'll go in, we'll take samples, about 30, we'll test soil samples on about 35 different metrics and multiple depths within the soil as a baseline. And then the first year of operation, we'll, we'll retest quarterly and share that information with the farmer. Tell them to really focus on the soil health metrics for year one and really look towards to see the benefits on the economic side in kind of year two. So in this case, after 12 months and virtually all soil health measures, they'd seen substantial improvements here, organic matter up to 56% available nitrogen in terms of solubilized nitrogen, 129% increase mycorrhizal fungi population of 2,800%, and then the biomass and bacteria being up substantially just shows how the overall organics increase because now you have a thriving soil microbiome again after being uh, depleted uh, over a long period of time. In terms of our, our go-to-market strategy, so it's, it, soil health is a global problem. It's $82 billion uh, market opportunity, the way we charge for our subscription service. We're currently focusing primarily on North America and where we have our initial systems placed in field, really Arizona where we're based, California, Texas, Florida, and the Pacific Northwest. And we'll expand from there in kind of a regional hub and spoke approach where we'll open a soil health center and service all of the systems we have in field in that region. To date, we signed letters of intent with growers and grower associations that represent approximately 7 million acres of irrigated farmland and our goal is to grow within them. So we'll start out with one or two systems on acreage. Once we prove out those systems in terms of soil health and, and economic returns to growers, we'll expand throughout their acreage. So it's very, very scalable in that respect. In terms of our the manufacturing river systems, we have a letter of intent with AGI, Ag Growth International, um, a global equipment manufacturing and ag tech company, 34 manufacturing facilities on six continents around the globe. It's really a great partner for us. They see the future really as being sustainable and regenerative agriculture as well. And through this partnership, they're taking a 10% stake in the company and their president and CEO is joining our board of directors. This will help us scale not only manufacturing, but also as we look to expand uh, globally going forward. And then in terms of our environmental impact, I really want to focus on, on this area too, because obviously there's tremendous returns for the growers here in terms of our system, but also we've demonstrated a substantial environmental impact from the use of our system. The first thing I want to talk about is regenerative versus sustainable. And, you know, sustainable, people seem to focus on sustainability, 
Think of electric vehicles, controlled environment, agriculture. Sustainable doesn't really make the world a better place. It, it doesn't make it any worse, but it holds kind of that one to one. And if you think about electric vehicles, if you plug in a in a Tesla in you know West Virginia, where ninety percent of the power comes from coal, coal it's not going to be necessarily one to one. Regenerative agriculture, actually, you know, we can say we, we're making the world a better place. We're capturing carbon, we're reducing uh, water use and improving something that's been degraded uh, going forward. And then in terms of some of the specifics, looking at decarbonization. So on two different areas of focus, for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, you can take 12.46 metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere per acre, or 45, almost 46 uh, metric tons in terms of CO2 equivalents, and you'll save 20,000 gall gallons of water per acre. When we translate that to the MyLand system that can cover a thousand acres, it's 1,284 metric tons of carbon capture potential per year, 4,700 metric tons of CO2 equivalent capture per year. And each system can save up to 7 million gallons of water on a per year basis. So substantial savings here in terms of carbon and water. And then a lot of people focus on kind of net zero and obviously a lot of the, the large branded companies we're targeting some point you know, between 2030 and 2040 to take a what's currently a, a negative carbon footprint and get that to zero. We start out net positive. So we've just highlighted here kind of a seesaw effect on a, on a screen. So taking FedEx as an example, looking to get to net zero by 2040. By 2027, we anticipate having enough systems in the field to fully offset um, that 19.4 million metric tons that FedEx is trying to offset by, by 2040. And then nitrous oxide emissions is something that, that shouldn't go overlooked here. People really focus on carbon. Nitrous oxide emissions really heavily dependent on synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. Nitrous oxide is 300 times as potent as CO2 in terms of heating the atmosphere. And if we're reducing fertilizer use by 20 to 30 percent, that has a, a very substantial impact from a from not necessarily a decarbonization perspective, but from a climate uh, perspective. And so these are some of the attributes in terms of decarbonization and, and our environmental impact that we wanted to highlight as well. But that's, that's the presentation. Again, uh, thank you to iSelect for allowing us to present. We're happy to answer any questions you may, you may have. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate your time and congrats on the progress. Uh, so to, to ask a question for those in attendance, the best way to do that is, as I mentioned, to go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and go to the Q&A pane and ask a question there. Or you can see that little hand icon a couple spaces over from the Q&A pane, from the Q&A icon, and you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. So I guess to get things started, you know, very interesting business model one that we haven't seen at, at ISLAC really at all. Well, wondering kind of about the, the, the proprietary blend that you guys are using. Is there, are there patents there? Or, or talk to me a little bit about kind of the, the, the competitive moat in terms of what the actual input is on the farm. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, thanks, Tom. And likewise, thanks to ISLAC for, for letting us present. So a number of of patent pursuits and intellectual property pursuits just generally. So we have a patent on the system itself, it's utility patent, but it's also has a method baked in for using the system to grow a crop. We've got a number of pending patents surrounding not only this system, but another iteration of our system that is that's smaller. It's the one that Peter mentioned earlier, that's up to hundred acres. And then we have a pending patent on using live native um, algae to rebuild soil, not only domestically, but internationally. So that's the kind of visible IP that we're pursuing, but there's also a great deal of trade secret value in what we're doing in the lab with respect to the um, algae that we are maintaining within the library and then the advanced biologics that are being developed there, as well as the software that's being built to operate the large system that uh, was displayed in this presentation. So what wasn't uh, discussed here was really that the future of the system 
will include probably some AI componentry, spectrum analysis, predictive maintenance on equipment um, that will also be proprietary and proprietary to us. Peter, one, anything to add? Yeah, one yeah. thing on that, uh, Tom, is I know you, you, you the question asked about the strains that we're using. So I just want to highlight that because we're not we're not looking at developing in a laboratory a you know special super strain of a specific organism. We're working with native algae that exists at the farm level. So every farm we work with, we're using algae that we took from that farm. We know it works. We know it's living in that soil. Mm -hmm. It's adapted to the environment, and so it's really more about you know boosting the overall soil microbiome with its own natural ingredients as opposed to trying to create you know, a, a super strain of something in, in a laboratory and then hoping it works in various regions throughout the country. Sure. And I know a lot of this is, is as you mentioned, you know, able to be managed and operated remotely. How often have you seen sort of the need for boots on the ground, mechanical interventions at the farm and, and obviously try to minimize those, but it seems like with something like this on farm, that's inevitable. What's, what's sort of the plan there and how do you minimize that and, and take care of those? Yeah, the, the, the plan is we always intend to have an on-site maintenance component of our business. In fact, their soil health centers, the maintenance personnel will, will go around to each of the facilities on a, on a routine and standard basis. So that will always happen, but most of that will be sort of typical routine maintenance changing valve you're replacing something that may have been broken. There's substantial redundancy within the system. To date, it's probably, Dane, maybe once or twice a week. I think as we uh, improve some of those aspects in terms of the software and the AI that Dane mentioned, more and more will just be done on a predictive basis back at, the, uh, at our headquarters. But we do always anticipate having boots on the ground on, our, on a routine, regular basis. Mm -hmm. Any, any plans for, for more functionality from a regenerative perspective? You know, I'm thinking, you know, you guys cover a lot of bases, but, you know, thinking in terms of other regenerative practices, getting involved in, you know, no-till or tillage recommendations or, or just things like that to be more comprehensive from a uh, regenerative perspective. What's kind of the product roadmap for you guys over the next, you know, 12, 18 months? Yeah. So I think there's probably two questions in there and I'll, I'll try and answer them. Dane, obviously step in here too, but in terms of other regenerative practices like no-till, cover cropping, crop rotations, those type of things, what we would call more holistic or fully integrated regenerative agriculture. We're not, we're not competitive with those. We can enable those practices in many ways. So if you're wanting to move to a no-till operation, creating natural soil aggregates uh, in the soil so you, you increase the porosity so you don't need to till the soil as much or at all potentially uh, allows you to move to a no-till. So we see those practices as being uh, complementary to us. But when you think about our, our system and the way we operate with the farmers, each time we install a system on farm, we now you know, think of it as a base station. We're out, we have a physical presence, physical manufacturing distribution facility on farm. We have access to power, water, and irrigation system on that farm. So as we look to expand into other areas, focus on soil health and regenerative agriculture going forward, be that other biological products that need to be delivered on a routine, regular basis, potentially through the irrigation system on farm, we'll be very well positioned to expand into those areas whether it be other technologies like drone technologies, on-site sensor technologies that we can feed back into our system in kind of a closed loop kind of way, we will look to expand into to those areas as well. But really that base station concept of our systems and the way we work on a service basis um, with the farmers, I think provides us a pretty unique opportunity to expand. Dane, do you have anything to add to that? I think you covered it. I think we work synergistically, Tom, with the practices that you that you mentioned. And if someone wanted to transition over to fully integrated kind of regenerative agriculture practices, I think we would help with that transition and uh, speed it up. Sure. 
Looks like there's a question from, from Abhay Singh. Um, they ask, is it full year application or soil amendment? What happens after canopy closure? At this time, it's direct into the soil. So a soil amendment, we have been kicking around the idea of it being a full year application. We do apply it through any irrigation infrastructure. So it is applied through center pivot. And so there is some foliar component to that, but we're not analyzing plant health as a result of that. We're really focused on soil health metrics, but not, not short term, but maybe medium term, we could, we could evaluate it because we have heard that there are some benefits to a live biologic like algae being applied in some foliar instances, but there's, there's work to be done there. Great, thank you. Great. Well, Peter and Dane, question for you guys. How can how can the audience here, both present now and, and those that listen retroactively, how can they help you guys? Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so you know, we, we're we're looking for we're looking to work with with growers, grower operations, and you know, partnerships. And so, you know, obviously I mentioned, you know, we, we have some pretty good, uh, pretty good partnerships developed already, um, but we're looking to expand with growers in all regions of the US and in various crops. So we'd love to love to talk to you on that basis. And then you can reach out to Dane or myself. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Yep. All right, the only thing I'd add is we're, we're a soil health company. That's our, that's our entire focus. We're excited to work with growers, but also anybody else that's out there focusing on, on a product or a service that might be complementary to what we do. Let's, let's have a conversation. Terrific. Well, thank you, Peter and Dane, for, for joining us today, and congratulations on all your progress and really such a cool approach you guys are taking. I'd also like to thank the audience for, for your active participation. As a reminder, we do host these agri-food conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. So if you want to share this with a friend, we welcome you to do so. A replay of the webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. So if you, again, if you want to share it, just uh, point Point your friends in the direction of agrifoodconversations.com and they can uh, register and, and view replays there. So we will be meeting next Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. We have a new month kicking off September. Our theme for September is cattle technology. And then we will be followed by uh, swine technologies and, and poultry technologies in October and November, respectively. So a cool three months of of livestock technologies coming up. We'll hope, uh, we hope you'll join us and, and spread the word. And again, Peter and Dane, thank you so much for joining us today and, and uh, congratulations. Thank you. thank you very much. Appreciate it.